Welcome back to another episode of the Hit Podcast. My name is James Layton, CEO and founder of Anderson James. This is the podcast where I bring you real life stories from some of the most interesting leaders of our sector. And we talk about the biggest challenges facing UK housing today. Today, I was delighted to be joined by Alex Wiley, the Director of Strategic Asset Management at Clarion Housing Group. Clarion are the largest housing association in the country and own and manage 125,000 properties in their portfolio. I talked to Alex at length around the decarbonisation and sustainability agenda and how Clarion are tackling the issues within that area across their portfolio of properties. If you like the episode, what I would ask is that you like and subscribe and that you share it with your network. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. How are you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad. Thanks, not too bad. Good, good. Um, I've obviously done you uh, an overview for the, for the listeners as part of the show notes, but just for, for, for their benefit, and you'll always do it justice better than I will, could you just do as, a, as an overview of yourself, please? Sure. So um, I'm currently Director of Strategic Asset Management at Clarion Housing Group. So Clarion is the largest housing association in the country. We own around 125,000 homes. Um, across you know more than 100 uh, local authorities and that but that more importantly that means we home over 350,000 people so it's a, it's a big job that we do um, I've been in this role nearly two years and worked for the organization in one form or another for over 10 years um, oh. so I've been in the housing industry a little while um, and before that I was actually in journalism shift um, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, before coming into housing so uh, but various different roles in, in housing from sort of the asset strategy side which I'm now doing as well sustainability did quite a lot of work around that regeneration so big big interest in people in their homes lovely nice thank you for that and and I suppose where I always like to start with is where did housing come from so if we go back to your early years how, how did you get into housing what was the what was the journey for you Sure. I mean, I think it's interesting whenever you talk to people working at housing associations, it's very rare to find someone who says, oh, from when I was a child, I wanted to work in housing. You know, <laughs> I think it's it's, uh, it's quite a lot of people that have ended up through various interesting routes. I mean, for me, it was I um, I left university after doing a languages degree and ended up in, in journalism. I wasn't a very good journalist. Uh, I was interested in people, uh, not so much the kind of editorial deadlines and, uh, um, you know, that side of things. Yeah. Um, and I did a piece towards the end of my career in journalism on the Olympics actually coming to London and oh. the impact that, that we, they were hoping to have on the economic development, social development of the area. Um, and I found it really interesting. And I thought, well, actually, maybe I want to do that <laughs> rather than actually write <laughs> about it. I want to get involved in, in doing that. So I, so I did a master's in um, town planning. Um, again, at that stage, I wasn't, you know, housing wasn't on my horizon necessarily as a specific course. Um, got very interested in uh, regeneration in particular and kind of renewal and, and, and helping um, improve areas of deprivation. And also very interested in, in sort of maximizing the triple bottom line. So trying to achieve that ultimate sustainability goal of, of having economic stability, you know, a positive impact on the environment and a positive impact on society. Yeah. Um, and that led me to housing associations. Um, so I started at what was Affinity Sun um, on their graduate scheme, um, which was great because it, it offered you an opportunity to, to sort of work in different departments and, and see which areas you might have strengths in or which areas you might be most interested in. Um, and within about six months of starting the graduate scheme, um, Affinity Sun launched a research project in retrofit um, and again, at that stage, retrofit, I'd kind of heard the phrase. I, I hadn't learned a huge amount about it in my master's. Um, so I, I went to work on that project. And that was really my kind of baptism of fire into the world of, uh, <laughs> of sustainability. You know, it was that project was incredible for lots of reasons. Um, I was very much frontline. So going to residence houses, I remember having a tool in my in my backpack that could fix some of the monitoring equipment we were using. I'd just go around and, and just sort of, you know, <laughs> proper hands on stuff. Yeah. Speak to residents about their bills, all the way up to doing the kind of financial monitoring and, and reporting and, and lobbying the government at the end of it. Um, and from there, I, uh, I sort of, again, moved around a little bit, went into asset strategy. So really looking at our whole stock and what a responsible social landlord effectively how can we properly manage our assets so that we're providing the best benefits for our customers for the people that live in those homes mm -hmm. but also for the for the business um, and so spent a couple of years working on that at affinity sutton um, before we came to 
the merger. Yep. And um, so there was a merger between um, between Circle Housing and um, Affinity Sutton. Um, and at that point, I sort of um, lifted my head above the parapet a bit, I suppose, suggesting, okay, this is probably a good opportunity just to to try something a bit different and get a bit more experience on some different areas. Because when it comes to asset management, I think um, there are lots of different facets to it. Yep. But for me, coming from the experience I'd had on my master's as well, um, I was really keen to get some of that practical experience in regeneration projects. And I thought, I think it's also, it was also really important for me to start to understand the face of new build and development. You know, there's often this big divide between um, development yes. and existing and new build and, and existing homes. And I thought, no, I need to, I need to get under the skin of that. So I um, moved into the role of uh, head of regeneration projects, um, working on a couple of different schemes across London, all the way down to, to Plymouth from some that were well into their sort of second, third phases. You know, yeah. Projects last a long time. Um, others starting from scratch. The so one down in Plymouth that we started started from scratch. Very much an asset management focus start to the project, which was really really positive. You know, really yep. looking at what is the best outcome for these these homes. Um, and um, and so that sort of continued for a couple of years. Some great experience. Some really some really good sort of frontline understanding of, of yeah, what yeah. it means for people. Um, and then uh, took on this role two years ago when the role was created at Clarion, um, very much to take forward our long-term asset strategy and really in recognition of the need for us to have a fully developed long-term asset strategy and one that could start to take into account the, the zero carbon and sustainability agenda. Um, so my role brings together three different teams um, across the business. We, we have an asset strategy team, which, which works really, really closely with lots of teams of business, particularly our, our asset management team in the housing association to sort of formulate our plans what is our strategy and then what are our targets within that strategy okay. and once we've got those targets how do our homes and our our communities actually work towards that standard um, and then the other two teams i work with is the regeneration team so when we've decided actually we've got neighborhoods here that, that need to start again and yeah. we need we know that we want to keep residents living there but those homes are no longer fit for purpose so we would look to regenerate and move people back in um, and then lastly, where homes just are not um, are not either fit for purpose for social housing or not fit for purpose for us. So we're not the best landlord to provide the service. We also um, have a disposal team that transfers homes to other local authorities, other, other housing associations. Wow, it's quite a lot. <laughs> and, and in terms of that, that journey when, when you were developing through it, it sounds like you got loads of great experiences on the way up to, to your current role. But do you think that's really important for people? Because like I've got a lot of listeners that, that ask me all the time, how do I get to that next level and how do I get to that directorship level role? Do you think that's important or has been important in your journey just to be able to get lots of different experiences under your belt and be able to, like you say, some hands-on roles, some strategy roles, some asset roles, some regeneration stuff? Is that important in your journey, do you think? Um, I think it's very personal um, okay. because, for, so for me, um, I think... It, it was important for me to follow my interest and my passion and, and start to build up my skill set around that. And I think for me, leadership journey is very much about, you know, following something that you're passionate about and, um, and areas that you want to have an impact in. What, what skills do you need? What tools do you need? What experience do you need to actually deliver that? Yeah. Um, and so for me, it was about really trying to marry that strategic focus with a real life experience. And I okay. think trying... For the role that I'm doing now and particularly around sustainability is you know we may well come on to talk about I think it's absolutely vital because it could be easy to sit in a room and devise a strategy for sustainability it's a lot of figures a lot of metrics a lot of calculations um but it's so critically important that you involve everybody in that strategy for it to work it's you yeah. know one of the there's lots of things you can do from a strategic side that don't necessarily rely on involvement or engagement with people this, no. is not, this is not one of them. No, that, that's good advice. And I think it leads me on nicely, actually. So just to give us, because uh, the scale of, of the business is crazy, as, as you said in the early part, give us a, a helicopter view then of Clarion Housing today as it sits here today. What's the, the size and scale of the business as we sit here today? Sure. I mean, we, so we, as I said, we own around 125,000 homes. Yeah. Um, and we've got significant development ambitions and um, so we built over 2,000 homes last year you know we're, we're looking to increase that uh, year on year with a big focus on affordable homes as well recently announced as one of homes england's um yeah, partners that. as well which was, was fantastic news 
Um, and we work with a number of different um, local authorities. Uh, you know, as I said, over 100, 150 uh, local authorities up and down the country. Um, housing many, many different different types of people and lots of them. So um, it's it's a big organisation. Um, we've got a you know, huge number of staff working across various different regions as well. Yep. Um, but it's something that we've focused on a lot and it was a big you know, part of the merger was trying to ensure that local focus as well as the, you know, there's, there's this, the benefits that the size brings, um, but we need to also ensure that that local focus as well. So that's something we work on pretty hard and, and certainly on the asset management side, when it comes to delivering large scale programs of regeneration or refurbishment, that can only ever be, you know, on a local scale in terms of, of engagement. So, of course. And, and how was it to bring the two asset portfolios together in terms of Affinity Sutton and Circle? Like that must have been really difficult because you must have had lots and lots of different um, properties in loads of different locations. How did you merge the two together and how difficult was that from an asset management perspective? Sure. I mean, all of the credit for that does go to others, as I only got this job two years ago, so it was yeah, after, yeah. after the merger. Um, but um, I think what was what was interesting was that when I was working at Affinity Sutton, you know, we considered ourselves to have a diverse portfolio because we had yeah. um, some old philanthropic, more traditional estates. We had ex-local authority schemes. We had um, all, all sorts uh, of different types and typologies and ages and constructions and and with the, the merger with Circle, that, that wasn't based on similar asset typologies necessarily, as far as I understand it, it's yeah, certainly based okay. on what, what we now now have. Um, and actually, I think that would be an impossibility with any any merger. There's, there's just It just doesn't exist within an asset portfolio. Um, so it certainly made it more complex. Um, data, which I think you could probably have a whole podcast on. Yeah, I bet. Uh, was, <laughs> you know, uh, many, many housing associations face this challenge, but it was, was a, um, you know, that... That that's huge because obviously you've got an enormous amount of data per household that you're that you own as a landlord um anyway uh, but when you then look at two different organizations capturing that data in slightly different ways uh, bringing that all together and being able to report on that and then analyze that so certainly as part of my role um, in the last couple of years big focus has been on how do we actually get to the bottom of the performance of our homes based on the data that we have we do a lot of work with the, the qualitative feedback so what people are saying what staff are saying what residents and local authorities are saying about the stock but how we really do need to get that strategic focus on the data as well so developing tools that help to analyze that and bring that to life and and, and show us where we might want to start targeting um our area our own interest yep. it's, it's a really important part of it and i think that was a big part of um of the merge big big part of the challenge with the merger around data yeah, and, and and on the data front, I've never seen as many uh, asset management data roles in my life. I think I think that's one of the biggest roles in the market at the moment. What tools are there out there that are really useful, or have you found useful to help you with that data analysis? Sure, people are, are using a variety of different tools at the moment. There are some um, organisations that that provide those, but actually, what we've done is built our own. I think okay. both organisations brought quite a lot of experience and their own data um, analysis models to yep. the table which has enabled us to build our own asset profiler is what we call it yep. um and that's actually been very much the best route for us because we know our data and we also know what we want to be able to see of course uh so it really helps and, and now that we've you know something again our scale has helped with now we've got the sort of um skills in-house and we've got that scale to be able to bring that together so it means we can we can set the framework and build a tool that you can sort of have from one asset all the way up to the whole portfolio what does wow. that mean in terms of energy efficiency what does that mean in terms of complaints what does that mean in terms of um you know spend Every. um so it is it is a um it's a really impressive tool that we've got but it's only as good as the data that we put into it yeah yeah as, as with all data and, I, and 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 as we look at, at your day-to-day -day then how does that work because obviously you've got the three different teams but what does your day-to-day -day look like i'm interested to see how you manage that many assets and what that that translates into a, a weekly workload for you in terms of what you do a lot of you spend a lot of your time on really yeah sure so i think most of my week is, is working with other people so it's always a team effort um, <laughs> okay. yeah. with, with something this scale and and in particular different teams so obviously mm -hmm. I work with my own teams but we I think asset management just is is it's never really been standalone sometimes in, in the past it might have been considered standalone but in order to work it's got to be um you know lots of different people 
coming together. Um, and it's and it's a real variety. It's sort of why I love my my role really is because I've got the strategic side. So so just this week we held a workshop looking at how we can develop a a set of tools that will help us understand the performance of our neighbourhoods. So how can we start to say we you know set a standard for our neighbourhoods that's nationally relevant but also applicable locally? Um, so that was you know started off with workshops a few weeks ago with residents and now we're looking to what we're working with the third party called the quality of life foundation and how we might bring that to life and put that to work in the ground so real kind of strategic researchy focused um workshop right down to you know looking at communication plans for new regeneration projects um at uh, you know looking at timetables for our sort of disposals program it's a real variety not to make that's the sort of plans for the weekend and obviously various different things come up such as this uh, yeah, or exactly. you know lots of different things that, that come up opportunities and another part of um, my role at the moment is speaking to bays in government um about the you know opportunities around retrofit and, and zero carbon homes so there's the, the government lobbying piece as well so it's, it's really varied i was going to ask you this actually i'm really interested in this but with clarion being the biggest um organization in the sector how much of the, how much of your time is spent lobbying government because clearly i mean they must come to clarion and ask a lot of questions because you've got the biggest portfolio of, of assets what how much of your time is spent actually speaking with government or, or how much time do, do you spend lobbying the government for stuff and ideas um can you give a bit of a woolly answer it sort of depends on the topic okay fine. um so um i think it's it's a it was seen as a big opportunity and we are now you know taking up that opportunity as clarion we've got a bit of a responsibility as well as as the largest to Absolutely. to you know put out there and share with government what we're finding what we're learning and, and trying to push for for change in yep. the sector where we see it it's needed um and there's an awful lot of work um you know going on in various different areas at the moment particularly with our sector, whether it's fire safety you know new build programs um and development yeah. or as it's sitting with my side on the on the sustainability side um and and it you know you get a variety of, of different responses uh it can be open doors because we're you know with they're, they're at the learning stage it can be a bit more that we're trying to you know full-on lobby them so it's um yeah it very much depends on the topic and also the timing i mean at the moment sustainability is in the news it's on the government's agenda you know we're we're very much sort of riding that train saying trying to drive it in fact saying yes come on let's let's talk about this let's see what we can do um so probably more time than normal at the moment yeah of course and it leads us on nicely to the decarbonization sustainability piece i mean for the the listeners i suppose what what's your understanding of the targets that we've been set because clearly there is a bit of confusion from people I speak to genuinely, like because you've got 2030 as a, what feels like a quite a clear date in the diary, um, but also 2050 and zero carbon as, a, as another date. What What's your view on what the, the targets are that we're setting ourselves as a country? Sure. I mean, as a bit of insight, we have lots of debates about this with many okay. parties. So, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I don't have the clear answer. But, uh, the way that we are working towards our targets and what we're hoping to achieve um, is that so we actually set our own um, long term asset strategy Clarion 2040, which is to the year 2040, um, a couple of years ago. And that was built through workshops with staff residents and, and setting our own strategy and under energy efficiency within that, we based our target on affordability for residents. So that was we, we, we've got a target of SAP, um, SAP 72, which is a mid band C effectively. Yeah. And it, that was based on the SAP assumptions, although assumptions, which is a whole other conversation, but SAP assumptions that, that people would have, wouldn't have to spend more than £500 a year on their heating hot water. Um, so our target at the moment is SAP 72 by 2040. Now, the, C, the EPCC target, which is kind of banded around and dates vary depending on who you're talking to whether it's, yeah, um, it does <laughs> um and and there's also with that is still and you know always it seems to be attached that caveat of wherever practicable and and um you know is possible so um it's never actually been set out as that firm hard target okay. it's something that we we're working towards and we feel we, we will be able to achieve as part of our 2040 standard um but there's a lot of caution around that because we have ultimately our goal is to reach that you know to work in with that zero carbon agenda albeit ensuring affordability for our residents as well yeah um so for us that that's that epcc target has got to be more of a step in the in the journey and the timing of that is critical you know we need we've got time to, we need time to work up 
what is the best solution that means we can get to zero carbon without putting stuff in now that we'll have to rip out without causing yeah. you know bills to skyrocket so it's really about trying to be considered whilst at the same time addressing those twin agendas of fuel poverty and and um, zero carbon so you know there's been a number of housing associations who've come out with slightly different approaches but i think we're pretty all pretty much all of the same mind that we need to do a fabric first focus on affordability with the, this is with our existing homes um, awesome. very much so you know the, the, the new site the new build side very different um and also it's not really an area where we we're looking at offsetting you know it just doesn't make sense for our existing homes for our business as a social purpose it's not benefiting our residents if we're off offsetting you know awesome. um for our, again for our existing homes this is talking about so um yeah so so we're we're working on a fabric first approach um, allowing for additional spend on that fabric first approach up to the year 2040 and also focusing on piloting different solutions now for the next sort of five to ten years to, to really work up what's the right whole house retrofit solution and also obviously waiting on the government's um, heating strategy to come out which will, will help inform that so the assumption is that we focus on the fabric focus on that protection from fuel poverty so that whatever heating solution we're in a good position and our residents are in a good position as well. Yeah, and, and I, I presume the scales in, it makes it a lot more difficult. And from what you said, a diverse portfolio of properties. Um, what's been the impact on Clarion's strategy? Did it change at all, some of the targets that have come out? Or is it, is it were you always looking to do this anyway from an energy efficiency perspective? That's a good question. So I think we were always looking to, um, because we've always had the fuel poverty agenda, mm -hmm. so we've always wanted to tackle the fabric of our buildings. Um, and and I think the last couple of years in particular, we're now getting more focused on the zero carbon agenda and what that actually means and how we need to respond to that. Um, so we, we set up, as I said, our strategy to the year 2040. We're in the process of, adapt, of updating that now to allow for zero carbon and potentially extending that to 2050. Um, at whilst at the same time sort of doing a dual approach, so extending the final target to 2050 but also introducing a shorter term target as well because i think you know um that's we it won't really work if we just sit here and say oh, we'll, we'll do this yeah. by 2050 it's a bit unrealistic <laughs> yeah i think that's where the target when when 2050 came out I was, I was thinking that is it almost feels too far away there's no there almost needs to be an interim target so i like that yours goes to 2040 how, how does that translate into a strategy for the next three to five years because does it does it tip out into projects does it does it just look like improving some of the things that you're currently doing in homes from a repairs and maintenance perspective what what's been the sort of impact on the strategy in the next three five year plan really mm. so we've um we've already got a program that's been going for a couple of years looking at our worst performing homes so that's yep. before, you know sort of d and below which is which is uh, reducing a number uh, you know very very quickly now thankfully what it does mean though for the sort of next three to five years is a combination of these pilots and trying to develop a program, a wider spread program that addresses the, the larger and slightly more challenging and um, harder to treat homes. So we were very much involved in the social housing decarbonisation fund demonstrator project. So we had two projects on that. Um, we were really keen to be part of it. It's exactly where our thinking is, you know, really testing out what works, what works with residents in, you know, in reality um, on this agenda and, and how our supply chain can deliver that it's really getting under the skin of it so that we're in a good position now with the, you know, for the first wave of the full fund that's come out. Yep. Um, and so for the next three to five years, it's sort of twin approach of, you know, targeting funding that matches where we're headed anyway, not doing mm -hmm. it just for the sake of it, but particularly on the piloting retrofit front um, and developing our own in-house program, that, which we were doing anyway, along the lines of SAPC um, by a certain time period. And, and the kind of third middle strand of that, which we're working on at the moment, is that engagement piece. So, you know, as I said, sustainable is very easy to talk about targets and programmes, and but, but none of that's going to work if the people who are delivering it, the people who are living in the homes where we're delivering it, don't know what's going on. Yeah, so there's okay. a sort of three 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 pronged attack. Yeah, it's really really useful and it, it's insightful. I think where where are you currently from a you'll know from the data obviously, but what what does it look like at the current levels from a portfolio perspective where you are around SAPSI and where 
you need to get to. So like, cause you can't, you can't make 125,000 homes Sapsi, in the next couple of years. It's a big project, but how, how many homes have you got that are at that lower band versus the ones that just need some minor alterations, would you say? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in the, the, we've got a fair chunk in the thousands that okay. still need some interventions um, yeah. that we're having to plan for. Um, and that's just to see, I think I said at the, at the start of our call, you know, if we were to look at zero carbon, that's almost oh, in the yeah, entirety yeah. of our stock, like, like most people. Awesome. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we have got um, a fair chunk and, and that's also part of the work we've got to do in the next few years, because something I found from that retrofit research project back in the day with Affinity Sutton is, is um, you, your data is only really the first step. And even sometimes surveys is only the second step. And the last step is actually going through that front door and discovering it's totally, you know, that yeah. the resident might have fitted something or there's been historic data or there's an anomaly, you know. So, um, but but at a portfolio level at the moment, we are looking at sort of the pro, you know, numbers are in the thousands in terms of programs of what we've got to do um, to, to get it to that level. Um, and and I think, yeah, as I say, that will that will evolve as our data um, yeah. evolves as well. And, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this. Do we think from an existing stock point of view, we could ever get homes from a retrofit perspective to zero carbon? Is that possible? Because they weren't built in a way that they're meant to be zero carbon, were they? Whereas new builds a different subject for me. I think we can get there zero carbon. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how we'd be able to do it from a retrofit perspective. How close do you think we can get to zero carbon? I think it's it's tricky. I mean, one of the things that the sector's been grappling with lately is what is the definition of zero carbon for yeah, social course. housing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so, that's oh, a God, I feel like also. I'm giving politician, I'm giving no straight answers. But, um, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I think, uh, again, it depends on the typology. So what we found with the demonstrator project is there are homes out there that we can make, you know, can really significantly improve from a D or an E up to a B or even an A. It is, it is possible. I mean, it costs money, but it but it is physically possible to make those changes. Um, but I suppose more of um, concern for us, because actually there's a sense that the, the technology will get there with zero carbon. It's another reason why we're not sort of doing it today. Um, you know, the sense that the, the, the technology will get there, will you know, processes will get there. Um, but um, yeah, I think the one of the challenges for us around fully achieving um, zero carbon is is what does that actually mean for the resident? Yeah. Uh, and and the use of those things that might be going in in terms of um, achieving zero carbon. Yeah. Um, and also, what are the other challenges facing us? you know really which which quite sort of banal dry areas but things like planning that might not enable us to do that right now and things like um when we have leaseholders in a block how do we deal with getting them on board and, and recharging and, and all of those sorts of things so there's there's the kind of technical side of zero carbon which we feel and we will you know where we can we will help um and where it makes sense for us and our residents we will pilot some of that technology to see if that is the right solution but um but there's so much more to achieving zero carbon than just the technology. Yeah, well, it's interesting because you've done the regeneration piece previously in, in your career. You know, when you start looking at some of the stock in, in I'm not saying in Clarion, in any of the areas that I live, um, you know, if it wasn't someone's home and there wasn't a resident and a story behind that home, in some cases, it'd be better to rebuild, right? And it would be better in some cases to start with a zero carbon new build in mind. But obviously, like some people are very attached to where they live and, and, and that's also got to be a consideration. But how have you involved sort of residents, end users in your sustainability agenda so far? I mean, how have you got them involved in, in this plan and this strategy? Well, so we're still at the early stages of developing our roadmap. Um, okay. But the plan is very much to engage with residents at a strategic level and, and um, you know, get them involved. And, and it, what's heartening is they're, they're keen to see it. You know, yeah. we had a, a resident, um, a large resident event this summer and it, and it came up a couple of times, you know, which is really encouraging because um, it's it's nothing's better than people when people are asking for something. <laughs> yeah, of course. You, you having to try and force <laughs> it on them. Um, so that will be a big part of our, our strategy. But actually on the ground, we're already doing a lot of work um, with residents around. We've got a, 
um, our foundation Clarion Futures has a money, money and energy guidance team. So that really is at the sharp end of people who are needing energy grants and, and trying to bring people out of fuel poverty from a bills perspective. And that will thread through all of our work and work on, you know, where we're doing work on retrofit as well. Um, and, um, you know, we're learning a lot from the, the demonstrator fund project that we did um, in terms of what uh, the, the sort of complete journey with residents, because I think historically, um, kind of traditional asset management has got a degree of engagement with residents, but it hasn't required anything really no. beyond can I come in kitchen, bathroom? You know, it, I'm not trying to simplify. It's still a very complicated. Process. Yeah, yeah, of course it is, but, it's, but, it but in has terms been... of resident engagement, it's reasonably easy sell. It is disruptive, but people don't have to move out. They don't have to change their lifestyle as a result of, of it. So we've been really trying to get under the skin of that with the, the demonstrator project and, and also from past experience, like from Future Fit, the Affinity Sutton project, you know, what actually works and, and, and at what points, um, because there's, there's the, the strategic sides have said that we want residents to feed into the overall strategy, but actually it's about the day to day. How does that work in their homes and beyond? You know, I've talked a lot about homes so far, but. What does that what does this mean for open spaces and, and nature access to nature and biodiversity what does this mean for your car and and if you're moving to an electric vehicle so it's just not something it's not an agenda where we can just go in do something awesome. that they're you know <laughs> they're happy to have done and then leave it, it's a huge it's a huge shift for, for asset management and it's and there's a lot of um but people never speak about this really i don't think but there's a behavioral shift as well isn't there and how we consume energy and, and all the other things that come with that but um it's uh, it's good that you mentioned it because i was going to ask about ev uh and that world what what what's clarion's view on a electric vehicle charging and and it feels like a big piece of work from an infrastructure point of view that how are you going to tackle that as a business do you think yeah so it's a project we're doing at the moment is looking at exactly that because um it's on two fronts really it's starting to be required more and more from planning on new builds so we're getting numerous new yeah. build schemes coming through now with uh, electric charging points and and also it's just you know if you look at the trends it's the way that the vehicle sector is moving and and a lot of people you know many of the people that we hope um, house um, work a lot of them may well work in industries that require cars and uh, for transport for whether that's you know taxi drivers delivery drivers, whatever that that means they're going to be transitioning as well and it require that charging um, so it's both a challenge and an opportunity for us you know we have um, we own assets we own land we own a lot of garages, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of which just aren't fit for purpose for modern cars anymore. You know, so we're, we are starting to look at um, a whole strategy for this. So both where it might work for us to locate these charging points. Secondary to that is obviously then can they actually be fitted there? As you know, we talked about the infrastructure, it's huge, huge yep. pieces around whether that's possible to be fitted. Um, where are the opportunities for us on sort of disuse spaces? But there'll be a big piece as well around that sort of testing and um, demand versus um, requirement, because the worst thing that we could do is do a huge program of it before we residents actually need it. You know, it's a complicated process when it comes to charging. And, you know, it's, it's a really it's going to it's a big thing for landlords, especially in built up areas. I can't imagine it's going to be easy to do that because um, I think in like in central London or, or anywhere in London, it'd be hard, won't it? Because people hopefully won't have as many vehicles but if they do there's a lot more high-rise stuff and other apartments and, and places and i think a bit, electric charging is going to be hard in some areas of the country definitely or harder to implement um what, when, when do you think like the year is going to be where we tip the balance though on electric vehicles because it doesn't feel like we're there yet but certainly in the next five to six years when manufacturers get top to stop making petrol diesel cars you can see 2030 onwards there's going to be a real need for charging isn't there in the country for sure definitely definitely and and we our business i think will suffer if we aren't prepared for that because people won't want to live you know when they do have a choice so a lot of our don't have a choice but where they do have a choice they won't choose to live there if we can't provide that so um it's but for us it's, it's as big as any other form of new technology it's it's yeah. everything from the installation the maintenance the, you know the charging the, the financial charging the billing all of that it's a big it's a big process that we've got to get our heads around and um, because as you say it's, it's coming and it's it's not at the moment um we're not getting you know huge amounts of demand from our existing customers yeah. um but that is it's increasing very quickly so it, that's the time scale for us is probably the next two to three years we're going to yeah. have to have a very serious strategy in place 
I read about, um, I can't remember who the developer was, but it's probably not relevant, but I read about someone saying that there was going to be a first development somewhere in Manchester, it might have been Birmingham, and it was going to be a no-car estate. Right. And that, that feels like a totally different level to this, but actually, because there was good transport links and et cetera, et cetera, they're going to make it a no-car estate, which, which, which is quite interesting as well from a green perspective. But um, what about the link that you have with the new build? We, we haven't touched on this, but clearly there's a big piece now. We're not going to build homes that aren't carbon neutral in the short term, I wouldn't imagine, because it's just going to perpetuate the problem longer term. But how much of a link do you have with the development team, the land teams, and, and how involved does your role get with that development piece as well? Yeah, so we've got really strong links um, yep. with the development, particularly through the regeneration process. That sort of helps because it is asset management, but it, it, it has huge development uh, implications as well and projects associated with it. Yeah. Um, and and it's critical, really, because um, the worst thing you, you want as an asset manager is that negative cycle of building new, coming into your priority problem sites. You know, that <laughs> it, it completely make, makes absolutely no sense. So, so you've got to have those, those links and... Um, understanding of standards and where things might have to be different, accepting that through the asset management process. Um, and on the zero carbon front, absolutely got to be as a minimum zero carbon ready so that they come into our portfolio and we can plan that because they're already ready to, you know, they just need the additional things, whether that's greening of the grid or, or whatever it is that becomes awesome. fully zero carbon. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely a really critical thread for us, particularly because we have these big ambitions for development and, and our delivery um we just can't separate the two no 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 for sure and, and on the retrofit things for, for homes that do need to get to maybe not zero carbon but but need to, to to be more efficient what techniques solutions are you currently looking at or are most effective for clarion in like the quick wins i'm thinking about the things that you can in, install into a house that really really do make the house more efficient what things are you seeing the most most successes in probably more a question for someone in our uh, more technical more technically yeah. qualified than me but <laughs> but one of the things we've um we've trialed recently and it's so far been having um sort of showing really good success it's quite simple but it's um it's an underfloor insulation um innovation oh. tool so it's called qbot and it's basically a little robot I'd, actually i think it has been around for a couple of years but but we've been trialing it in, in some of our harder to treat homes and it's a it's a remote control robot i hate to simplify it like that but it's basically what it is wow. it goes, goes <laughs> under the floorboards and you you know you, know, you drive it and it and it blows out insulation and that that can have a huge impact on our sort of subdivided properties old street properties right um and very low in, intervention in terms of for the residents um and something that can be done quite quickly so that's definitely something that's kind of we're starting to look at right amazing we, we can get more of those robots <laughs> feels, feels a bit ai that doesn't it it feels know, like another level to be honest robots and um, and what about from a, you mentioned this but and i agree with you technology keeps coming and coming and coming and it's evolving our industry every day is there anything in the pipeline that you can see that's coming that's going to help us manage this from a uh, energy efficiency point of view or, or what technologies do you think will be really important in the future that might help us first identify where a house's efficiency is but secondly help us to you know like I've been looking at stuff from an EV point of view and you can get really quick data and you can also uh, create solutions from that data in other areas of the market such as manufacturing is there anything that's coming out in housing that you think might help in terms of technology Good question. I think I probably would say this with my background, but I, yeah. <laughs> for me, it's the area of um, inside the house, that interaction tool with residents. So and bills and usage is yeah. going to be absolutely critical. So how is it the smart metering going to evolve effectively so that yeah. it's something that can do both both engage with the resident around their own usage and their own air quality and all of that sort of thing, but also help inform us around where there are issues, both where there are issues that need majorly addressing or where there are maintenance issues from what, things that we've already fitted. Yeah, I think okay. that's going to become a really important part, particularly as kind of asset and, and housing managers, that's going to be really important. Yeah, no, no, so. that's really useful. Um, and, and in terms of where do you see the challenges of, of the country, not Clarion necessarily, but where do you see the challenges of us not achieving the targets that we've been set from a, an efficiency perspective or a carbon neutral perspective? Where, what do you think is going to hold us back, if, if anything? Oh, there are a couple of key things. Um, I think money is one of them, financing. Yep. 
it's a big big challenge in this area it's the the sustainability agenda and zero carbon agenda particularly requires a totally different mindset around financing um programs in terms of returns and and what expectations and it, it cannot solely rely on grant um so that's going to be i think there's lots of um you know lots of pieces of work going on at the moment looking into that and the, we did a piece of work with the green finance institute um a little while ago looking at all of those different mechanisms that could be brought into play because that's the other thing with the finance there's not going to be one answer to this and yeah. And at the same time, we're kind of, you know, working with our funders on ESG funding, particularly for our new build, uh, which is going to become more and more prevalent, I think. So definitely cracking the nut of financing and and twinned with that really is, is the policy piece and trying to go beyond the, the election cycle with governments. Yeah. It's just got to become an agenda that doesn't change yeah, yeah, with, within a government cycle, but certainly not every four four years um because that's what we've had and and it's so disruptive this is something that needs an industry to be built up over the longer term it needs financing to be built up over the longer term it needs people to be taken on that journey so for it to chop and change very dramatically you know from whether it's to do with the levels of energy um company funding that comes obligation funding that comes through um, down to just the political view on it you know at the moment there's a lot of momentum behind it there's a lot of uh, appearing to be some cross-party buy-in for the for the agenda at least um, but those those sort of twin um are the big big challenges for us and then i think that the the last challenge and particularly on the financing around affordability because there's financing for the able to pay market <laughs> never mind you know what we need to consider for um for those that are at risk of fuel poverty so it's a it, it's a really really complicated side of things that needs to be cracked i think one that we're trying to do some work to help solve yeah. um but but then, as we've talked about, there's the technical side, the engagement side. There's all those other challenges. But I think it's, those two are, will help us will help us solve those other ones if if we have the yeah. the funding and the policy mechanisms that should pave the way for supply chains in the market to develop some of these solutions and for people consumer demand to understand and consumers to understand what it is we're actually trying to achieve. Yeah, and it's difficult, isn't it? I I, I really feel for housing associations at the moment in the sense that. Uh, especially being honest it's the smaller ones especially when you start looking at building safety lots and lots of money needing to go into that and, and rightfully so um lots of money going into the um, carbon neutral and, and energy efficiency plus the government driving the housing crisis and we need new homes <laughs> it's 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 a real tricky tricky time to understand how we navigate like you said the revenue to be able to do all those things on all fronts um it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting sort of five six years because there's a lot to be done in a very short period of time and you know there's gonna have to be a lot of funding available for that to all happen in in in, in parallel how, how much of your role gets involved in building safety we've not talked about it but from a, a clarion perspective what's the the current plan on that or is that not under your remit currently so we're all um, sort of have an element of safety within our in our roles. So it's yeah. part of our strategy setting. I work very closely with the, the um, property services director who is responsible for safety um, mm -hmm. to set that standard. Um, uh, but it's very much, yeah, very much more in his remit, I think, rather than mine in terms of yeah. the day to day. But but one of the um, things that, that I do have to look at is that kind of long term financial planning for all awesome. of those different things you've just raised aside from the, the new build but but also once once we have our sort of bucket of saying this is what we might need it affects what we can then spend on new build but um and the way we sort of think about it in terms of our strategy and again this is why we, we're trying to work with government on this taking place in terms of timelines is that fire safety is a um it's an immediate priority awesome. and it's something that is being addressed and needs to be addressed in the short term retrofit we feel is a medium to longer term it needs investment now but it's a longer term program and it's one that we need to be working up towards yeah. particularly with the transition away from gas um in sort of 10 15 years time. that that's what we're working that will be the kind of um you know huge hike up in terms of spend but we need to be working up towards that so it's awesome. it is very um it, you know it's, it's different for us as a, as a large organization but that is the sort of mentality, if you like, that we're operating under, that we accept that we've got to, and it's quite right, you know, we've got to focus on safety, but that doesn't mean we can 
we oh. have to completely forget about retrofit. It's just at different time scales that they're being delivered. Exactly. And it does feel, as I said, it does feel like they've all come at the same time. So for some yeah. organisations, I bet it's going to be really difficult to navigate that. How, um, I was just thinking about this, actually. We talked about the government and the lobbying upwards, but in terms of um, Clarion's positioning in the market, how much collaboration do you have with other housing associations and how much innovation tank shared ideas do you have with other organizations do you generally get involved in collaboration stuff with people to to try and this is why i put the podcast together is to, so that people can learn from others and, and try and like shortcut some of the areas where they might might, might come into to danger how much collaboration do you generally have as an organization with other businesses in the sector yeah, quite a lot so so we have um a number of different groups that we are part of and actively work with so there's a lot there's the G15 in London and there'll be various different groups depending on what, what we're working on. There's the environment group, et cetera. Um, so it's very much part of our, our approach and our philosophy is to, to collaborate, particularly, as I said, we've got this responsibility as the largest that, you know, we, sh we should really be sharing that. Um, and, and actually on a, on a more micro level, the SHDF project has really enabled us to do that because that has, you know, government's keen for us to do that as well. And because we have been able to, with our supply chains, we've been able to get in there and learn those lessons um, with the safety net of the scale of scale of Clarion. Very keen and very happy to. We do. We have. Um, I think we've had a couple of sessions where we're sharing that with with other organisations. Um, and really, ever since the days of Future Fit, which was all about sharing everything, you know, warts and all, we shared everything in that project, <laughs> all of our pain, um, because it will save. It will. In the long term, this is an agenda that will affect everybody. You know, it's not really a comp competition it's not. Uh, situation. <laughs> so yeah, of course. It's only going to help. And also, we're only going to benefit from learning from other people as well. We're not just because the biggest doesn't mean we know everything. Of course. So exactly. it's 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 got to go two ways. No, no, that's that's really useful. And and as we come to a close and look at, at sort of the future, where where do you see the future for Clarion? Because clearly, um, there's a lot going on there. <laughs> and I mean. Having a, a strategy to 2040 can sometimes be, wow, that, that's a lot that we've got to get to. But what do you see the short, medium term sort of like future for Clarion? I mean, when it, when it comes to um, strategic assets, I think the short term is going to be really starting setting out our stall for how we are going to get more close to the, the zero carbon agenda and zero carbon targets. Um, and, and really starting to deliver against that i think that's the critical thing is that it again it's as I said before it's quite easy to strategize uh, it's much harder to actually deliver against that <laughs> and then measure your impact against that so i think for clarion we've got we've got a, a long-term strategy now we're developing that in terms of sustainability and zero carbon and we're really passionate about that being two-pronged really one that it is also about affordability for residents and tackling fuel poverty and the other that it's about broader sustainability so it's not just about um, the, the zero carbon homes agenda um, so longer term we will be looking at our full strategy to 2050 that incorporates all of those things including access to outdoor space and as I yeah. said and, and air quality um, and then also how we you know um, deal with climate change and tackle some of the issues we have around that um, and in the in the shorter term, it will be about learning and <laughs> refining our data. I mean, really um, a brilliant project that's been kicking off lately with our Clarion Futures colleagues is, is we're starting to work with some green peer researchers. So these are some of our younger residents who are looking at mapping our green areas, um, which, you know, it, I think that's just the way that the asset management is moving, asset strategy, sorry, is moving, is much more to not just engaging with people this affects but working with them to you know help set the set the start, set the strategy so you know our, our now our asset management team is also looking at residents doing stock condition surveys so it's really i think on a kind of philosophical side we, with the future is looking more inclusive and you know very much focused on that wider sustainability whilst also starting to deliver um deliver against us and and you know the um the government funding the shdf thing will be a part of that in the very short term we hope of um and and as will our own our own programs in terms of sustainability but definitely it's at the moment it is forming our plans assessing our data getting our residents involved getting views in and setting out our stall and our roadmap that will get us to 2025 to yep. 2030 to yeah, 2040 and then to 2050 <laughs> you know we we can't have our, our starting point right okay 
we'll just leave it till 2045. Yeah, absolutely. You know? absolutely. And, and I mean, honestly, like I could, I could listen to you for hours on these subjects, but um, as we wrap up, the one thing that comes across for me is how passionate you are about the sector. I mean, genuinely like comes through in everything that you talk about. One, one of the other reasons that I do the podcast is to try and get the sector on people's radars that might be considering where they're going to go, like, and the next generation of talent for our sector. What, what, what would be your advice on how we can attract that next generation? Because I find this stuff fascinating. I don't know about you. I find like the whole energy sustainability, net zero, I find it really, really, really fascinating. And I think it really does talk to the younger generation that are coming through university, college, et cetera. But what can we do more, do you think, to, to really promote our sector and really attract that next generation of talent coming through? Yeah, well, yeah, it's just speaking to preaching to the converted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something, we just, something we discuss a lot. I, I think um, I think there is a general kind of worldwide movement at the moment towards interest in climate change and sustainability. Yeah. So it will be about setting out, articulating where we fit into that, you know, how big a role that we play in that and and i think the twin with with the social impact that it can have in our businesses is a big is a big selling point now you know that um if you're someone that is interested in the environment and interested in society and generally that does come in you know together um it's sort of the perfect place for you to to start to have a real impact in that on on those twin fronts and i mean you know we look at I, I couldn't quite believe it, but we look at the closures on the M25 this week from Insulate Britain, you know, the, the most unsexy yeah, <laughs> part yeah. of the climate change agenda ever. And it's, it's, you know, I'm not commenting on whether it was the right thing to do or not, but, but it was, it, uh, even that surprised me that we were starting to get something that's always been considered the very dry, boring side of the climate change agenda. It is starting to rise up people's consciousness. And I think the more we can articulate the impact that this is having, um, or could have and needs to have yeah. on people's lives um, and so it's not just about kind of technology and um, and wind turbines and, and things like this awesome. it's about it's about your life it's about my life you know it's about about having that positive impact um, whilst also contributing to the to the reducing carbon so awesome. yeah that's my that's my big yeah <laughs> honestly and I think the, the cells there and like, like you say I think now we've transitioned into that people used to almost think housing was a, a boring sector and, and and i've been in it a long time so i'm 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 converted i'm, I'm preaching to the converted by, by talking to you around it but i just think that there's so many facets that are interesting now it really is a different sector what it was 10 years ago uh and it's and i'm really excited to see where it transitions um final thing and i always finish here but just in terms of um the future of housing if you were to change one thing i mean you've already talked about this a little bit but if you were to change one thing in uk government what would it be um that's God. one thing <laughs> to help the housing sector i mean just in terms of like how how would we help the sector i think if housing and particularly retrofit within that could be considered a national infrastructure okay. priority yeah i think it's you know it's such an important part of people's lives housing the ability to to have a roof over your head and the impact that then has on many other sectors for it to be considered housing to be considered a national infrastructure priority in particular within that retrofit mm -hmm. huge it should be considered a huge government program up there with transport you know up there with those other ones so yeah i was trying to wrap my brain to think what would my comms manager tell me to say but that is what i think <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's definitely what i feel anyway is because and it would also mean it would go through successive governments you know you're the so, first person to say something different to planning so i'm, I'm pleased uh, <laughs> that we just had a different answer to be honest but well, that everyone would be else a very close planning. second yeah, very close yeah. Second. But yeah no i think i think that just that continuity in mm -hmm. people's minds and policy and and all of that through successive governments is is what's required and and, and placing the importance on it and the funding behind it yeah no really really nice way to finish and Thank you very much for coming on. Honestly, it's been brilliant. I could have talked about the energy and sustainability stuff for hours and hours and hours, but I've, I've really loved listening to your story and I'm sure people will get loads and loads of value from it. If um, if people do want to reach out to you, is, is the best way for them to reach out on LinkedIn? I'm sure people might have follow-up questions around some of the sustainability stuff that Clarion are doing. Are you happy for people to reach out and, 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 and ask you anything? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Perfect. All right, I'll put the link in the LinkedIn book, but great to catch up. All right, thanks. Thanks. Thank so you very much. much. Cheers. Bye.